Oh, everyone. Good evening and uh, welcome to the webinar Solid Cam Eye Machining. Uh, we will start in approximately three minutes from now. We will wait for more people to join in. Thank you very much for your patience. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar on eye machining, which is the revolution in uh, CNC machining. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience. And uh, we will begin now uh, the presentation. Uh, I'll just explain to you how we are going to go about because it's going to be uh, a session that will have uh, portions of presentation, portions of the software, back to the presentation again, and then back to the software. And at the end, I'm going to take Q&A, but uh, please uh, keep putting your uh, questions into the questions area so that I will take up this Q&A at the end of the uh, session. First of all, let me introduce you. Uh, uh, my name is Amod Onkar. I'm the country head for SolidCam in India. I'm also the product manager for SolidCam for the products of three axis and five axis worldwide. Uh, this presentation is being done by me. Right, <clears throat> let's quickly uh, run through the uh, first few slides. First of all, it's our mission statement that we are here to provide you with something that is uh, powerful, complete, easy to use CAM solution. So that, that's very important. First, it has to be powerful. Second, it has to be complete. That means it must be complete in every aspect of manufacturing where we cater right from simple two and a half axis milling to up to 16 axis mill turn, everything in one environment. And also we include other technologies like wire EDM and probing within our ambit of our offerings to uh, the customer. And this comes coupled with the revolutionary eye machining and it's fully integrated in SolidWorks as well as, uh, as, well as uh, Autodesk Inventor. So SolidWorks and Inventor are our two front-end CAD systems 
and solid cam is integrated into both of these CAD world, uh, world class CAD systems, which offer the CAD front end for us and solid cam takes over the entire manufacturing sitting inside the environment of these two products. Solid cam is not a new company. It's uh, basically a old company. It was founded in 1984. We have more than 36 years of expertise in cam development and application with over 210 people working with us uh, worldwide. We have two offices in Israel. We are an Israeli based company with approximately 50 staff and our largest operation is actually out of uh, Germany where we have seven offices and approximately 80 staff. We have our international support uh, center based out at uh, Serbia where we have six members handling the entire international support. And then we have affiliated companies in Europe uh, also in Asia Pacific Rim in asia pacific direct offices are in india japan and china i'm going to come to the indian uh, operations in a bit and we have worldwide distributed network of more than 65 resellers selling our products and supporting our products worldwide with more than 45,000 licenses installed worldwide so it's a not a small company neither it's a very big company we are somewhere in between in germany we have got seven offices and uh, all of these offices are in different parts of, of the country i'm talking about uh, germany because it's an it's a ideal office for us where each of the offices are not simple table and chair offices or computers offices but we have some of the most complex machines sitting inside our offices in germany as well as few other countries worldwide for example in germany we have in our technology center a Hermle c35 access machine we also have a dmg ntx uh, uh, multi turret multi spindle multitasking machine uh, basically it is used we do a lot of uh, uh, we do a lot of uh, trials we do a lot of parts that we cut on the on the machines we also uh, check our software whether the features that were designed are working accordingly or not so all these testings happen in different parts of our offices on real machines the latest addition to our family of machine is a citizen suncom d25 swiss type machine which is installed in our office in germany where again we test our latest product of swiss type by the way the swiss type webinar will happen on thursday in the evening please please register for it also uh, so we also test our newly developed product of swiss type on actual machines and just not on screen so this machine is also a part of our offerings in germany where we have it inside our office in japan we have a very powerful reseller called tactics and they have like uh, 10 offices across japan and they also have a technology center where they do a lot of testing for us a lot of parts are being cut we train a lot of people and that's called as a live factory and inside the live factory we have got uh moriseki uh machines like uh moriseki nt4250 and also moriseki nv5000 these are the machines that are there as a part of a live factory in 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 with our reseller in japan coming back from Japan to India. Our operations basically started in 2008. We have offices in Pune, Bangalore, New Delhi, Ludhiana. These are our four direct offices. Apart from that, we have resellers. And apart from all our direct offices, we also have resident staff in different cities in India. We have more than 1,000 customers. Uh, and we employ 40 people directly on the roles of solid camera of which the distribution is like we have five salespeople, 31 technical support two documentation who do the documentation for our products worldwide and two are from the admin side we have an average growth rate of 20 percent and we are a de facto standard today in the multi-turret multi-spindle milton machining and high performance milling our customer domain is across aerospace, power, oil and gas, general engineering, and dye mold. So that's how we are distributed across our uh, domains, with aerospace uh, occupying the largest chunk of our business, followed by 
medical, power, oil and gas, general engineering, and then diamond. Our worldwide customers are all top-notch companies, and they are from different domains like aerospace, automotive, uh, machine design, electronics, medical, optics, military, consumer, energy, production shop, mold and dye, prototyping, and technical. And these include small job shops, medium-sized engineering, manufacturing companies, and large aerospace and automotive corporations. All of them are part of our family of salt care. Talking about the family of solid cam, we also have got third party interfaces that are directly built in from uh, solid cam. For example, for G code simulators, we have got a direct interface to Eureka, and we also have a direct interface to Vericut, where you can directly send the entire project for simulation on either of these G code simulators. We also do robot programming through Eureka Robot and Octopus. So we have got all these direct connections to the robot programming interfaces. And we also have direct interfaces of all the tool management, the top tool management companies worldwide, like Wintool, TDM Systems, Innova, Wardex, that's especially for uh, thread milling, Zoller, and Carmex. All these interfaces are directly built in. Apart from third party interfaces, we also have technology cooperation partners, which, uh, which are basically uh, from uh, tooling background like Hoffman, Vidya, Iskar, and also from the machining uh, side like Hermley, Grob, Hulls Metal, Haas, Citizen. So we cooperate with them worldwide everywhere on these technologies. Coming back to the product. Uh, solid can, like I said, is integrated into SolidWorks and Inventor. So there are major benefits working with an integrated CAM system. First of all, you get the same look and feel of the CAD platform. For example, if I talk about solid can, you get the same look and feel about, of SolidWorks into solid can. So if you learn solid can, SolidWorks, about 60% of your learning of solid can is already done once you learn SolidWorks. We have full associate between the CAD and CAM. That means if your product design happens inside CAD and you're done the machining on solid CAM, and if the design office or the design person makes a change to the CAD product, solid CAM will automatically update the CAD or the CAM programs. No user intervention needed. Of course, we have got switches where we can make this changes either automatic or semi-automatic with a user interface. Inter user intervention. Since we work directly in the assembly environment of both SolidWorks and Inventor, we have got complete, uh, we have got a full permission to use the assembly functions of both SolidWorks and Inventor that allows us to define fixtures, toolings, wise clamps, etc., and then carry that entire assembly into manufacturing. So you can actually see the entire assembly on the machine as if it's happening live in front of you. And we have got 17 years of working experience with SolidWorks as a gold partner. Gold integration is basically one of the topmost integration levels that you can achieve with SolidWorks. It means that your product is seamlessly working inside, the, inside SolidWorks without any flaws, without any issues. And whenever there's a design change, SolidCam understands it easily and the changes are passed on to the CAM programs automatically. Coming to the uh, uh, solutions that we have inside uh, SolidCam, apart from what we are going to talk today, we have uh, two and a half D milling, we have got uh, three axis milling, we have got feature recognition machining, we have got advanced mill turn, Swiss type turning up to four axis. The entire machine can be simulated using the machine simulation. We have got five axis simultaneous machining uh, and basically eye machining 2D and eye machining 3D. So our focus today is actually going to be on those two products and not on any of these products because we might see this product some other time. But today our focus is going to be on eye machining 2D and eye machining 3D. So let's talk about uh, eye machining. <clears throat> eye machining integration, like I said, we are integrated into SolidWorks and we are also integrated into Inventor. So obviously eye machining is also integrated into SolidWorks and also into Inventor. But eye machining is also available as an OEM integration in C.
is it audible now okay thank you sorry i think there was an issue with my uh, so i'll just repeat a couple of my earlier slides so let's go back to uh, i machining as a as a machining solution first of all we talk about increased productivity due to shorter cycles time savings of more than 70% we are going to come to this uh, statement once i go into the software dramatically increased tool life it's not just a statement but uh, i'm going to show to you a hard evidence of some research that was done uh, some time back with a tooling company where we uh, found out that the tool wear first of all is uniform and it has got a minimum tool wear when it even cuts material as as hard as titanium or inconel uh, outstanding small tool performance uh, basically uh, i machining's performance goes up dramatically high as the tool diameter comes down so it works very well with the tool diameters that are smaller if you look at our competition they always propagate this theory that try to take a bigger tool as possible but in i machining we can go down some of our customers have also machine parts with the diameter of the tool as small as 0.5 millimeter whereas we can do the machining even with the smallest of the tools so we have got an excellent uh, small tool performance the software is available for four axis i machining and also for milton it has got a very high programming productivity just four steps that are needed and uh, nothing more than that it has got a shortest learning curve in the industry that means just half a day training and you're through with i machining you don't need anything more than that it has unique technology wizard which provides optimum feed speeds taking into account the tool paths the material the stock and the machine into consideration before it generates anything so basically i machining has got two components in it i machining has got a component of an intelligent tool path generator and it is also a technology wizard which generates uh, the optimum cutting conditions for a given machining operations. So, I machining is completely different from its competitors. Okay, all our competitors will either tell you to pick up a tool catalog and multiply the feed speeds by three or four times and use it. They are not sure, or they will give you a table of parameters. This machine, this material, please use these parameters. I machining is completely different. I machining generates its own set of cutting conditions i'm not going to talk about parameters but i'm going to talk about cutting conditions because it, it includes a lot of things apart from simple feeds and rpms it also includes the depth of cut it includes the strategy it includes the engagement minimum maximum it also includes the force and the chip thickness that is generated from this entire cutting so these are the two components which make i machining pretty unique so what are the current problems that you have with the standard tool paths that you have today? The conventional uh, tool paths that are generated by CAM so, uh, systems. First of all, they are non-tangent tool paths. You get uh, sharp corners, and these sharp corners produce a lot of mechanical stress on the machine when they have to tra translate from one direction to the other direction. The second one is overloaded tool. You can look at this example out here when you're trying to take a full depth of cut engagement with a full flute and you go into the corner, you actually engage the entire flute, almost everything of the tool into the material. If the material is soft, you might get away with it. But if the material is slightly hard, I'm talking of even 28, 28, 20 uh, to 30 HRC. If the material is slightly hard, it can just disintegrate the tool completely. So in order to avoid that overloading, what we'll basically do is we'll reduce the depth of cut. Okay, instead of going 20 millimeters in one go, we might probably go two millimeters, two millimeters, two millimeters, and so on. The third one is cutting air. Although most of the softwares today are driven by updated stocks, there is eye machining is an, a league apart. Okay, so 
sometimes most of the times the stock defined is only a static stock and the software doesn't know exactly what it has done before unless and until it just doesn't recalculate so it many times you get into a, uh, situations where you actually start cutting air what does i machining offer as a solution first of all i machining offers smooth tangent tool paths okay there's absolutely no sharp corners anywhere second control stepovers we are not overloading the tool at any given point of the time and exact stock machining this is what we call as a dynamic uh, stock management where the software knows precisely how much material is remaining and what is the engagement it needs to take so we are cutting exactly the stock and not any we are not cutting air at any given point of time so we offer these three solutions as a part of i machining's technology so we have now let's talk about the features of i machining if you look at our competition okay because people ask me uh, what is the uh, what is the method that you use in i machining so there are several methods today in high speed machining first of them is the uh, constant step over many softwares use this uh, principle of constant step over they try to keep the step over constant wherever they're going okay so that's one one uh, the second most important theory is constant engagement angle okay we are talking about an engagement angle here okay we have the first point of contact the first point of contact is here and the last point of contact is here when the tool is engaging into the material this particular angle that forms this alpha is the engagement angle so there are some other groups of software which talk about keeping this alpha constant throughout the cut but solid cam comes in a different league that's why i said we are completely different we are talking of constant cutting force and we do the constant cutting force using few theories first of all we vary our alpha we have an alpha minimum and alpha maximum so this alpha keeps varying between these two values we find out the best possible alpha the minimum maximum based on our, our calculations and the alpha will keep varying apart from varying the alpha which is just not enough we also vary our feed rates based on that contact angle alpha all right so for example if my alpha is let's say 20 degrees if this is 20 degrees my feed rate for a particular cut uh, happens to be 3792 for the same area for the same geometry if my alpha is changing to let's say 50 degrees if this alpha changes to 50 degrees my feed rate drops automatically to let's say 1675 by doing that by varying the alpha and by linking the feed rate to the alpha i am actually generating a constant fz value okay what is an fz this is basically the chip thickness so next time when you run an i machining program and you like to check this chip thickness you can just grab a random chip from the cut and measure it with a vernier i machining will actually predict that chip thickness much before the cut happens okay so whether it is cutting a straight line or whether it is going into the corner you can be rest assured that your fz will always be constant that means the chip thickness will always always be constant cutting tool theory says if my chip thickness is constant the force on the tool is constant if the force on the tool is constant i get a much better tool life than by getting a cut that that will have variable forces acting on the tool right so one of the reasons why we get very high tool life with i machining is the fact that we maintain constant cutting force on the tool now this is from the uh, physics point of view 
going into the tool path point of view, we have got several features inside iMachining. First of all, we generate what we call as a morphing spiral. We take, for example, in this case, the point, and we take the outer profile, and we collapse a spiral starting from a point to the outer profile. Why spiral? Spiral is the most efficient method in cutting any part, okay? It is the most efficient because there are no retracts, nothing, it just engages in one, and by the time it finishes, it would have cut the entire stock. So it is the most efficient method. So our first priority is always to generate morphing spirals. Now, many a times it is not possible, okay? That's process limitation that you cannot apply morphing spirals everywhere. For example, in the second uh, uh, image that you're looking at, I have a wall here. Obviously, I cannot generate a morphing spiral. The morphing spiral, because that's our highest priority, I machining tries to find out ways to apply morphing spiral even in this situation. What it will basically do is if this was my volume to be cut, okay, if this was my volume to be cut, what it will do, it will first create a channel here. It will create another channel here by trochoidal. It will create another channel around the wall. Okay, so when this three channels get created, it gets three chunks of islands where it can apply morphing spirals. So it has created three chunks here, chunk one, chunk two, and chunk three. So these three chunks will now will then be uh, uh, will then be used for creating morphing spirals. So this is how my final toolpath will look like for that particular region. So you have got channel number one. I'll call it C1. We have channel number two, C2, and then we have channel number three, C3. That creates island number one, which is done in spiral. Island number two, again done in spiral and island number three again done in spiral, okay? So this is a split second decision that SolidCam makes, iMachining makes, to generate the most optimum toolpath in the least possible cutting time. So it calculates a lot of things before it does these, uh, these things. Now another complex example, if I look at, uh, of, at the morphing spiral is here, this particular part. In this particular part, you can see that it's even more complex. It's not about walls, now we have got islands. So it creates the first morphing spiral here till it comes and touches this island, okay? So there are two islands here. Once it, it comes close to the island, it will stop and it will generate two channels around the island. So it will open out. Which, which means that now the islands are taken care of. Once these islands are taken care of by channeling, it again generates another morphing spiral, right? So it generates this morphing spiral. It keeps making the spiral, and then it comes and touches this island here. So it cannot do the spiral again. So now it figures out what it needs to do next to keep the machining time minimum. So it figures out that it can make, or it needs to make, this channel again around this island. So it makes this channel around the island and then continues again with the morphing spiral. <clears throat> right? So it continues around with the morphing spiral. It keeps alternating between channels and spiral, channels and spiral, till it comes to a situation where either of Either the channeling will work or only the spiral will work. For example, it could reach or get into a situation here. Could get into a situation here where it is no longer possible for it to make a spiral. It could, it can, provided it makes a channel here and then separates this chunk of material and then applies the spiral. But that is a decision I machining makes. It calculates internally whether this is going to be faster and efficient or this one is going to be faster and efficient. If it feels the first one is going to be faster and efficient, it skips the spiral and just keeps making trochoidal kind of a toolpath till it gets into the corner.
ओके सॉरी लेट्स मूव अहेड आई मशीनिंग also has the ability to do rest material and finished cuts if the uh, if the parts are prismatic parts okay when i say prismatic it means there should be no draft to do those parts in that case i machine can also finish it but if the parts have draft then we have to go to another solution called i machining 3d where it can also do rough and rust rough based on pure stock principle so i machining can also handle rust machining as well as finished cuts finished for prismatic parts only right so a part like this you can see how the tool paths are created we have got very smooth tool paths it ramps into an area and then it machines for example in this case uh you can see that spiraling was just not possible so it made a split second decision no spiraling it just creates a channeling kind of an operation whereas the pocket here has got ramp it has got space to do spiraling and once it touches these three walls it stops the spiraling and continues with the challenge with the channeling so then no longer uh, spiraling is possible same way it applies the same theory to the others first one the first portion i talked about was of the tool path itself the second part is what we have now is called the technology wizard today the most basic problem that a programmer has or a machinist has is actually getting the right cutting conditions how do we do the right cutting conditions if a person or a programmer is very experienced then it's pretty easy for him he has got tons of years of experience behind him and he uses all that experience to generate the cutting conditions but even then a lot of times they go down to the shop floor and then they fine tune those cutting conditions so it's never a straightforward method where we take the tool path sent to the machine and it will work 100% so there are several uh, what you can say gaps between what we use to generate the cutting conditions cutting conditions by the way are determined by material tool the geometry and the machine okay so you have got the material you have got tool you have got geometry and the machine but within the within the ambit of material or tool or geometry or machine there are several other things that need to be taken into account when you are generating the cutting conditions or parameters what we call from the material side we have uh, cutting speed what is the maximum cutting speed this material can handle what is the hardness of this material i'll tell you why this is important just the cutting speed is not enough the machinability of the material is also very important okay so hardness is important here what is the maximum radial step over the stool can take into this material and what is the minimum step over it needs to keep maintaining without the chip thinning happening okay so this is from the material side these are the four additional things that you need to take into account when you are generating the cutting conditions from the tool length of the tool is very important outside holder number of flutes helix angle chip thickness and the hardness that is basically the carbide grade itself matters a lot in deciding the parameters from the geometry apart from the shape of the part the depth of the <coughs> depth of the profile to be machined is also very important when you are considering to calculate the cutting conditions from the uh, machine point of view we have maximum rpm this machine supports what is the maximum feed rate what is the maximum power available on the spindle and what is the memory that is available on the controller because i machining programs are pretty lengthy programs okay 
and you cannot break the programs in between and say i will do a little bit now and then i will send another set of program later on no it doesn't happen that way so memory of the controller is also very important for us if the memory is short then we need to find ways of running this program not from the memory but maybe from a usb or a memory card itself in the machine so it's very important to figure out that also and these also go into setting of the uh, parameters for i machining so how does i machining take this into account first of all i machining has got a database that means the database that comes with the software is blank we do not supply anything okay so the user has to decide what material is going to cut on what geometry he is going to cut on what tool he is going to use and what is the machine that is going to cut that means i need to specify the physical properties of the material i need to specify the 3d or 2d geometry that it he is going to cut the user needs to specify the tool properties which is not just the diameter but also the length of the tool outside holder he also needs to specify the helix angle of the tool he also needs to specify the flutes he also needs to specify the cutting length of the tool not just diameter and length okay we go beyond that and of course the carbide grade this is also very important so we have specified the material and this material we need to specify the ultimate tensile strength of the material you get this ultimate tensile strength either from your material supplier or you can get it from websites like macweb.com where you can just key in your material and it gives you the entire chemical and physical characteristics of the material including the ultimate tensile strength of that material geometry like i said it could be 2d or it could be 3d from the machine side we do need several things first of all we need the maximum rpm we need maximum feed rate we also need the continuous spindle power okay and the spindle construction the spindle construction i'll come to it when we get into the software so we need to know all these things in solid cam right so assuming that we defined the material geometry tool and the machine correctly i machining then generates the cutting conditions like feed rate step over rpm depth of cut strategy the power that it's going to pull from the spindle the maximum we see that it is going to use for the cut and it the uh, chip thickness now all that will be Taking, taking into account these four things that you define. So you won't get some crazy parameters like 600 VC. No, if the machine is not capable of handling that VC, we will never touch that VC in, on, in our machining. It will always be within the four given corners of this, uh, these things like material, geometry, tool, and machine, right? Now, once it generates the ambit of parameters, what we have defined here is the machine rpm feed spindle rpm and spindle construction however what we cannot define here is the condition of the machine we cannot say we cannot tell to the software this is new machine this is old machine this is somewhere in between we cannot tell that what we also cannot tell is how we are holding the part because then it becomes a real complex FEA algorithm, okay? Then you will not get a tool path, but you will get several analysis, which you'll have to use further on. So in order to avoid those complexities, we have left a couple of decisions to the user. First of all, he has to figure out the condition of the machine. Second, he has to make uh, the uh, decision of his holding. Once he has done, SolidCam gives levels, right? SolidCam gives uh, levels of material removal inside we have level one which is associated with the least mrr or the minimum mrr needed and we have got level eight with the maximum mrr that means level one will be with the least aggressive parameters and level eight 
will be with the most aggressive parameters and anything in between two three four five six seven are basically are associated with combinations of intermediate interpolate or rather interpolated levels of mrr so we have got level one to level eight minimum aggressive maximum aggressive and then in between are just interpolated between minimum and maximum so if the machine is a bit old and if your holding is not good i will just pull the slider back and probably i will use level four here but if i if i say my machine is brand new my holding is on a hydraulic wise i know that this is an excellent setup i make, i can jump immediately to level eight and it will machine at level eight right once we uh, <clears throat> set these uh, uh, mrr levels we go into another topic and that is the uh, issue of vibration and chatter vibration and chatter many a times people uh, think is a very easy topic but it goes beyond just adjusting the rpm and feed rate i remember when i was doing my engineering back in the late 80s and uh, i was given a part to machine on an m1 tr really very old m1 tr machine and it was a slot that i had to cut and i was taking two millimeter depth of cut and at two millimeter the machine was vibrating and i was really afraid that i would break the tool so i went to my uh, training officer a very old gentleman who was my teacher at the time and i said look i'm taking two millimeter depth of cut in mild steel and it is it is vibrating i'm unable to uh, cut this and i'm i'm afraid that i'll break the tool so i asked him should i reduce the depth of cut or make it a little bit slower he said don't do it amod increase your depth of cut to two to three times okay i was taking two millimeters he said go 10 millimeters i said will it not break the tool he said no i'll come and stand let's both cut together so i increased the depth of cut to 10 millimeters and i started cutting all vibrations chatter everything was gone it was a really smooth cut that i got <clears throat> i never understood that principle at that time till uh, i started working with i machining i machining comes up with something very interesting it comes up with a possibility or a, or a solution called as an actual contact point it's a parameter inside inside i machining an actual contact point is basically the contact points that are calculated by AI machining when the tool is at the full depth and it calculates how many points, <clears throat> sorry, how many points are in contact with the, uh, how many points of the tool are in contact with the wall of the part that is being cut. The, uh, the whole thing here is that in actual contact point we always must strive to achieve a whole number like one two three now what are these uh, actual contact points the actual contact points are these points here okay and these are driven by few things okay the number of contact points that are going to be against the wall are actually driven by three uh, few things first of all the diameter of the tool Okay, this influences the contact points. Second, the depth itself will influence the contact point, this depth. The third that thing that influences is the helix angle of the tool. Remember, eye machining is very, very categoric about asking for helix angle of the tool. We must specify the helix angle of the tool. And the third thing, uh, fourth thing that is, uh, that is needed here are the number of flutes. So these four things, the diameter, the helix angle, the depth and the flute number of flutes influence the contact points. You can see that if my depth of cut is less, my actual contact points are less. If my depth of cut increases for the same tool, same helix angle and same uh, diameter, my actual contact points go up. Like, like I said, you must always strive to generate a whole number, okay? For example, in this case, I'm seeing that at the depth of cut of 1.1 inch, I'm getting an actual contact point of 4.5. When I go into eye machining, there are zones for machining, okay? The first zone is a green zone. The second zone is a yellow. 
and the third one is red okay at 4.5 it will put me in a zone between yellow and red which means it is actually telling me that you're going to have vibration and chatter more than a moderate amount of vibration and chatter induced in this cut how does it make this prediction okay when you have a whole number in contact with the wall like one two and three the force acting on the tool is in one direction linear okay and here the cutting is stable when you go into a situation when it goes into 4.5 okay which means you have got four full contact points or let's say this was 3.5 in this case when you had four full contact three full contact points and the fourth point was only half okay this point here is actually in air so the force acting on this point can be in any direction when you get into a situation like this there is imbalance in cutting and this imbalance in cutting causes vibration and chatter if you don't believe me today you can do this experiment tomorrow whenever you get a chance to go onto the machine calculate the actual contact points for the for the cut it's very easy to calculate that go with uh, 3.5 or 2.5 and then go with either 2 or 3 and you see the difference of the finish on the wall you will see a dramatic difference straight away when you are getting a full contact a full whole number contact and when you are having this decimal contacts uh, as as an actual contact point so i machining generates these contact points when we already define our process and this is one of the uh, one of the results that it sends to the user that he makes the decision much before he takes this uh, part to cutting it also it's also a very good method of uh, deciding which tool you would like to use okay probably i have got a 45 degree tool and that's giving me 3.5 uh, actual contact points i could change this tool to a 35 degree tool probably it will jump to an actual contact point of 2 and that will give me a much better cutting okay so it will also give you a great this it will it's a great tool to make decisions on what tool to order and what tool to uh, use for cutting right so this is another very important feature of i machining it's called as an actual contact point but i call it as a uh, vibration and chatter prediction tool all these things that i just showed you are actually patented these are patented in the us and it's a i think it's a 100 100 year patent and nobody else can copy this this is the most important thing that nobody can copy this and it's very unique that's why we say i machining is the original it's a unique thing what we have and not not just me but our customers vouch for this okay so the entire thing that i showed you acp i showed you morph morphing spirals technology wizard all those things are basically patented uh in solid cam right <clears throat> so if i uh summarize on the features of i machining we have got unique toolpath pattern constant cutting force that's that's our usp optimum cutting conditions determined by the technology wizard and we have got vibration control inbuilt into the product it predicts vibration and we can take care of it i'm going to show that when we go into the product right many a times when people start working with eye machining when they start working with eye machining the first uh, immediate observation they make is the vc that it generates okay for example let's say you're machining stainless steel and you're used to machining a stainless steel between 80 and 100 vc I machining will generate its first level of VC of close to about 150 to 175. And that's the first complaint. First observation, oh, you're generating pretty high VC. How will the tool manage such a high VC? Or sometimes people come and say, look, this tool is not meant to go at these parameters. To explain that theory, I have a blank slide because I would like to explain some very interesting theory on which I machining is based. This particular theory, uh, I'm gonna make a few lines and then I'm, I will keep explaining. 
this particular theory uh, comes from the year of 1931. There was a German uh, scientist called uh, Carl Solomon, and he was a metal cutting uh, scientist. Okay, and he formulated this theory. Today, when you go to uh, today when you go to the cutting tool manufacturers or the cutting tool theory, it's always a linear curve. Okay, so I have got two lines here. <clears throat> My x-axis is the VC, which is um, in meters per minute. And my y-axis here is the tool tip or tool edge temperature in degrees Celsius. What you know about, or what we all know about uh, the uh, VC versus temperature theory is that there is a linear curve, okay? What does this mean? As my cutting speed increases, my temperature of the cutting edge also increases. Okay, that is a theory we, we all know about, and that's a theory that we work with. But this gentleman called uh, Carl Solomon, a German scientist, he found something else, and uh, he of course, at the end of the session, you'll ask me, how did he achieve such a high VC? I'll answer that. He found a uh, completely different, I'll mark uh, in, in a different color. He also found that as the cutting uh, VC increases, the temperature goes up, 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 okay? But at certain point of VC, at certain point, the temperature starts plateauing which means it doesn't change, it remains constant. So what Solomon did was he pushed the VC to about five to six times of the conventional cutting uh, VC. And he, what he found was dramatic. The cutting edge temperature actually starts dropping, okay? So higher the VC, lower is the cutting edge temperature. This is what he propagated in 1931. And this is also called as the Solomon's curve of high speed machining. Till 19, I would say till 2000, 2010, he was actually ridiculed. Not many people followed that principle in, in real life, okay? Because there was no way to touch this, okay? till all these high speed machining concepts started coming up and now when you go to google you can do that even right now and if you google solomon's theory of high speed machining you can see immediately this is a chart that will come up in the very first search okay it was a it was a theory that he propagated in 1931 and he assumed that at a certain cutting speeds which are like 5 to 10 times higher than the conventional machining the chip tool interference temperature starts to decrease, okay? It's maximum, it, it comes down a dramatic for non-ferrous materials. For steel, it is not that dramatic, but it still keeps dropping down. And for uh, tungsten carbide and other things, it still drops down. That's why when I'll show you the examples of tungsten carbide, you will not believe it, but that's what actually happens here. <clears throat> there are several questions here and I will keep answering one of them as we move into the slides, okay? So now what I will do is go into the software and see how iMachining works. <clears throat> Sorry. So I have uh, a part here and uh, we're going to look at machining this part with eye machining, okay? I am assuming at the moment that the stock that I've defined is exactly the size of this part. So I can look at the stock, show 3D, and this is how my stock looks like. It's a simple block. <clears throat> okay, it's, it's a block. Let's come back and I'm going to define the prerequisites for 
iMachining. So let's go into our database. So I'll edit my database. Now, because I've been working with this product for a long time, I already have created my own database. But today, I'm not going to use any of that. I'm actually going to use my own created database at the moment. So the first thing is the machine. So I'll say new machine and I'll put a name to this. I'll say us UMC 500 SS. That's the machine that I'm defining. It's a five axis machine, of course. Uh, so once I say a new machine, you can see there are three things that marked in red. And this is the things of the machine that it is expecting the user to define. So what it is asking, it's asking me to define the RPM of the machine, the spindle RPM, the maximum RPM. So I'll say this is a 12,000 RPM machine. And it is asking me the const the continuous feed rate, that's a G1, say this is 15,000. It's also asking me what is the spindle power continuous, not the five minute or 30 minute rating. It's asking me to define the continuous spindle power here. Okay, this, let's say it's 7.5 kilowatt. It's kilowatt, yeah, 15,000. And then it asks me the efficiency of the spindle. This is where I come to the construction of the spindle. The efficiency of the spindle is based on the construction of the spindle, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so we have got few values here. 75% efficiency is for gear-driven spindles, okay? I've got 75, I've got 90 for belt-driven spindles. And if it's a direct spindle, then it is 95% efficiency, okay? Now, why this efficiency is needed? Based on the construction of the spindle and the parameters that I've defined, solid cam in my background, you don't see it, generates the power torque diagram of this particular machine, okay? And because it needs to find the sweet spot of this machine. Then I go here and define a number six, I'll come to this and I'll save and exit. Again, edit the database and I will go to the material now and I'll define a new material. This is aluminum 6061 and the grade is T6. Okay, so what it is asking me now is it's asking me the ultimate tensile strength of this material. Okay, it doesn't know the name just by defining aluminum, it doesn't understand. So I also don't know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to matweb.com. I'll open uh, MatWeb on my uh, uh, in my browser, and in the search, I will say aluminium. Aluminium six zero six one. Enter. Okay, so it's given me a few search results. Six zero six one T six here. If I select. It gives me the com complete chemical composition of the uh, of the uh, material, and it gives me several other uh, physical properties of the material. I am interested in the ultimate tensile strength, which is 310 megapascals. So it can vary from supplier to supplier. It can go from 310 to 400. So it's always better to get in touch with the supplier who will give you the test chart for that material and the uh, uh, ultimate tensile strength is there on the uh, upper right corner. It will be always in Newton per mm square, but megapascals is also good enough for us. So it's 310 megapascals. So what I will do is I will put that value here, 310 megapascals. Okay, so that's done. Save and exit. Let me select the machine that I just created. Uh, UMC 500 and also the material. It's aluminum T6. Yep, there it is. Say okay. Right. <clears throat> I will go to the tool library and remove all the tools that I have except the facing tool, of course. I don't want any of them. Yes, please. And now I will add a 2D operation I machining. 
it's very simple once i'm into the uh, operation window i've got feature recognition which means i don't need to really define uh, profiles or anything it's called as a feature recognition where i've got feature recognition by faces feature recognition by chains feature recognition by outside edges or manual definitions by chain so i'm going to use the feature recognition by faces and what I'm going to do here is, I'll select face here. You can see it's selected the face. And once the face is selected and I go into the tool, you can see what it does to the chain. It says that I have a closed chain inside and an open edge out here, which means that it's already telling, the geometry is already telling iMachining that you need not do any kind of ramping into this profile. You can approach this profile from outside. And this is exactly what iMachining is going to do. So let's pick the tool. And I'm going to define a bull nose, 12, let's say with corner radius one. Outside holder is 50 and I'm going to uh, select a shrink fit holder in this case, since it's a BT40 taper, I will use the BT40 shrink fit, uh, 12 by 50, yeah. So that's how my tool is gonna to look like. All right, let's go to iData. That means it needs something more than the tool what I've defined. First of all, it needs to understand what is the helix angle of the tool. So by default now, it has picked 45 degree medium. I'm going to leave it there. And then it needs to know the grade of the tool material, whether it's plain carbide, cobalt, HSS, or premium grade carbide, which is a fine grain carbide. So I'm going to leave it at regular carbide. Accept this. So by doing that, you can see I machining has already calculated the volume to be scooped out. It knows the top point, it knows the bottommost point, and it knows the precise volume that needs to be scooped out here. Next, levels, you can see that the level is already set. The depth of the depth that it needs to go is 42 millimeters. So I have defined my machine, material, tool, and the geometry. The four conditions are already set. Once that is done, if I go into my technology wizard, you can see here what happens. iMachining has already calculated for me everything, okay? I did not have to key in anything, and there's no way for me to key in into this, okay? Because it has done every calculation for me. The RPM it has decided is 7,649. Mean feed rate, that is neither the maximum nor the minimum, but in between, like I told you that we vary the feed rates. So the mean feed rate is going to be 1.7 meters. Step over radial a maximum is 2.44. Minimum step over is 0 0.326. That translates to a VC of 288 and a chip thickness of 0 0.09. So FZ also is calculated. If I probe in further, it is going to take 1.8 kilowatt from the spindle, okay? That means it's only going to use 1.8 kilowatt from the spindle to cut this part. And the maximum cutting speed that can be achieved on this on this particular machine, on this particular, with this particular material, with this particular tool, and the geometry is 332. You cannot go beyond 332 on this machine, okay? Right? So this is the envelope that it creates for itself. What we have here, you can see that it has put me in a green zone, which means I'm going to have least amount of vibration and chatter in this cut. It's going to take 20.86 millimeters per cut. So the depth of cut will be 20.86 every time. And it's going to take two depth of cuts of 20.86 that generates an ACP of 1.11. I said whole value, about 10 to 15% variation is allowed. It could induce a very, very minor unnoticeable vibration, but that's fair enough, right? Once that is done, I go into my technology. I set how much material I need to leave here for my cut after my roughing is done, how much material is needed, and I simply hit save and calculate. Once that is done, you can see that the toolpath is already calculated for me. It starts from outside, so if I run my simulation, let's go into the 
and let's go into the uh, this mode so that I explain to you very easily. Okay, let's switch off the holder. That's the engagement. Okay, now please look here and, and on this window here. Okay, you can see that there is a cutting angle coming up and there is a feed rate. As and when the cutting angle keeps changing, you can see that the feed rate either keeps up or goes down. Okay, you will never see the feed rate constant. The feed rate is always changing because the engagement angle is varying. As the engagement angle varies, the feed rates also vary. And this ensures that you will get a constant chip thickness when it is doing the cut on the machine. So if I actually show you how it looks on the machine, <clears throat> can load the uh, actual machine here. I can open the door. And that's the part with the uh, with the holding equipment, this device, and it's loaded and it's ready to run the simulation. I can simply run the simulation here. And this is how the simulation will move. Okay, we can do both material simulation as well as wireframe simulation. Right. Now <clears throat> I have machined this part in aluminium, and this is where the whole whole uh, game changes with eye machining. My manager walks in and says that, look, the customer has called in for a change in material. We are no longer going to cut this part in aluminum. We are actually going to cut this part in steel, okay? A 48 HRC steel. The moment somebody announces moving from one material to the other material, all hell breaks loose. What happens? Oh, now we need to calculate everything right from beginning. Call the tooling supplier, phone him. Tell him that we are now moving to a 48 HRC tool steel and we want to cut this part. Get the parameters from him, the tool from him, everything. With eye machining, for me, it's as good as changing the material here. Okay. So I have got in my database, I can define, but I already have because I had this in my database. I have a bowl of tool steel, which is a 48 HRC mold steel, and the, uh, and the, uh, Tensile strength for this, the ultimate tensile strength is 1050 Newton per mm square. So it's a much tougher material, much harder material than aluminum. So I'm going to pick that material here, bowl or tool steel, say, okay. It's telling me, eye machining is warning me that there's already one tool path calculated with an older material. Do you want to update the tool path? I'd say, yes, I would like to change the tool path. Let's go edit this. What I'm going to do here is I had three fluid tool. Okay. I can check with three fluid tool also. Okay. Let's do that first and then change the tool. With the same tool with three fluids and the same diameter, same helix angle, if I go to technology wizard, you can see eye machining is recalculated the entire cutting conditions back again for the bowler material. Right. What is the RPM? 2704 feed rate of 994 step over is maximum is 0.5 minimum is 0 0.09 that translates to a vc of 102 and a chip thickness of 0 0.07 now we know that when we were uh, cutting on aluminum we had a certain spindle load when i move to impacts bowler a tool steel let's see what happens to the cutting uh, to the spindle load you can see my spindle load is just one third of what I was doing using with my aluminum, which means I'm underutilizing my spindle here, right? So we need to change this. My manager says, look, it's it's pathetic. You're just using 0.5. The machine is capable of going to 7.5. Do something. I don't have to do much. I just push the turbo mode here. The moment I push turbo mode, you can see what has happened. It has picked everything that is available to it full 7.5 this is actually not a great sign but i'll tell you why because generally spindle life is calculated at 70 60 to 70 percent of loading continuously 
never to be done at 100%, but in short run cycles, you can still load the spindle at 100%, okay? So it's pushed the power requirement to 7.5 kilowatt. And what has happened to the cutting conditions? You can see here, my RPM has jumped to 9,370, mean feed rate of 2.2 meters, maximum step over is 3.5, minimum is 0.99. That translates to a VC of 353. I mean, nobody would have heard a VC of 353 on a 48 or 50 HRC tool steel. Okay, we are not used to that kind of a VC. Now I will again refer you back to the Solomon's theory of high-speed machining, okay? We always have to keep that in mind. Okay, for me, it's as simple as that. I'll save, save this and let me calculate this tool path. <clears throat> right, this is done. So if I uh, now go into the cam tree view and ask for the machining time, you can see that it's going to take three minutes and four seconds to cut the spot, okay, at level six. Level eight would have brought it further down. Now let's assume I've got the same pocket on this side and we had to do the same machining using a regular conventional machining uh, system. So I will just go to my templates here. I have got the conventional uh, pocketing strategy. It's an open pocket. So I'll drag it and drop it on this part here and I've got the tool path. Let's uh, edit the parameters and let's compare the time, okay? I'm going to go to the tool data. The VC here I'm going to take is 140. Okay, that's something coming from my tooling side. That's 3,173. My feed per tooth here is 0.1. So that is, let's say, 1,200. And Z down is 750. Let's save and calculate. The time here is 17 minutes. And we are talking of a time of three minutes here with eye machining. You can realize the difference that it does with harder materials because if it was soft material, you would have said, oh, I will take five, 10 millimeter depth of cut here and I will give you the same time of eye machining. But remember that in eye machining, I also have the turbo modes. So I can go even much faster than what probably you might think and imagine. But on hard materials, you cannot take that chance. You have you will be very safe, whereas I machining will actually go beyond your expectations on even hard materials. Okay, so this is a bit of uh, I machining 2D. Somebody asked me this question to show me the red, yellow, and green zones. For example, here you can see that I am in a green zone because my tool, my depth of cut, flutes, and the cutting length are all matching. Now, I just go into the tool, I select. Uh, and instead of two flutes here, I make three flutes. I say, okay, I'm having a three flute tool here. I go to the technology wizard. You can see that it puts me into the yellow zone, which is basically the zone where I can expect moderate amount of vibration and chatter. Why? Because my ACP here has gone beyond that whole number and it's gone into one point some decimals, okay? So it's assuming now here, you're going to have moderate to slightly higher moderate vibration and chatter. This is what eye machining predicts. Even before you take this tool path down onto your shop floor, this is a correction that you need to do, okay? So you can do this corrections in, in, in a different way. For example, I can go back into the tool again and say that, okay, this was three, three flutes. I'm not uh, getting the uh, thing I want. Let me go, go to 35 degree helix and check what happens to the technology wizard here. You can see, Three flute with a 35 degree helix gives me or puts me back into the green zone. Okay, it's completely different. It's predicting a lot of things that could happen or that could go wrong on your machine, and you need to correct it here. Okay, so now I'll I can go to my tooling supplier safely and say, look, I need a 12 R1 with three flutes and 35 degree helix and that particular cutting length. I know this works going to work very well on my part. Okay. So this was about ACP. Let's get back to our presentation and let's go a step further. <clears throat> and let's look about uh, eye machining 3D. Eye machining 3D basically is a... Eye machining 3D is basically a... 
it's a continuation of iMachining 2D, whereas iMachining 3D will use iMachining 2D to generate the slices. It will go to the de deepest possible part first using iMachining 2D. Once the pocket is opened out, it will then use what we call as a scallop step up and go from bottom up to create the scallops in three dimensional to generate the roughing profile. So it's basically a combination of iMachining 2D plus a very intelligent uh, scallop driven step up. So it uses the optimum machining of each Z step using the proven iMachining algorithm. And it does the deepest roughing cycle with the whole flute length first, shortening the tool life and increasing the increasing the cycle, uh, shortening the cycle time and increasing the tool life. And then whatever material was left out because of the deep pocket will then be removed using a constant scallop height moving from bottom up to the top. Okay. So I'll I'll also show you a part in how how it does. Uh, it has got a dynamically updated 3D stock. That means it knows the stock precisely at every point of con of cutting. So there is absolutely no air cuts, and the toolpath automatically adjusts the parameters. It also adjusts its position to avoid any any collision between the holder or or the arbor's arbor with the uh, stock. And at every uh, scallop that it generates and every scallop that it jumps back, it readjusts the parameters because the contact there changes. So once the contact changes, the ACP varies, it readjusts the parameters for each slice. It's not a constant feed and a constant uh, step over that takes for each, each slice. It keeps varying the slices. Okay, uh, somebody here. I'm sorry. I'm also, I'm also uh, <clears throat> taking questions. Somebody asked uh, in 3D I machining after after you finish OP10, how do you transfer the stock to OP20? It's very simple. I go to my last process and I say I'll add another dummy process, or I could just say save my last process as a stock and save the stock can be saved with respect to another coordinate system, which I'll be, which I'll be using for. OP10. So I can transfer my stock from operation to operation, okay, without uh, without doing any kind of tricks or anything. Just go to the last operation on your OP10, right click, save stock as STL, transfer it to OP20. <clears throat> uh, somebody is asking me here at the increase in depth of cut uh, for end mills, vibration will reduce, but the load will increase. Uh, you're right, load, load will increase only for those systems which do not take into account the machine parameters at all. I machining is not a blind machining. I machining precisely knows what is the spindle power available to it. So it will readjust everything to bring every other cutting conditions within the ambit of the islands that we have defined, machine, material, tool, geometry. So it always knows these limitations, right? In most of the other CAM systems, it's like you have got a Ferrari to drive. Somebody has blindfolded your eyes and switched off the light. And you're asked to drive in pitch dark. You don't know whether the road ahead is a straight road or it's a curved road. So you assume that it's going to be a curved road and you start drawing, going slowly. Eye machining is not like that. We are not blindfolded. We have our lights on. We precisely know what we are doing. Okay, so even if I machining, if the load increases, I machining will readjust its parameters in such a way that it will bring everything within the ambit of the definitions that we have done. So in I machining 3D, we have got optimal the Z slice machining. So it will take into account the full depth of the part and it will check with the ACPs what is the maximum depth of cut that it can take efficiently. It will first take the full depth of that in I machining 2D, remove the volume. And once the volume is removed, like in this case, it takes the full depth of cut. Okay. And then it generates a scallop based step up. So uh, the user defines that he's, he's, it's uh, one millimeter is acceptable or 1.5 millimeter scallop is acceptable or 0.5 millimeter is acceptable. Once that scallop is defined, based on the scallop the user has defined, software i machining will then calculate what it is needed to provide this scallop after doing the first deep 
machining. Okay, so it does the Z step up and generates the scallop as per what the user has defined. Right, so you can see a part like this where we have got a 3D shape and where I've defined the machining. It will first go down to the deepest possible point, come up and then start generating the scallop. Okay, so first it does the deepest point, then comes up, generates the scallop so that it makes the machining very efficient. <clears throat> it has got absolutely negligible repositioning, which means there are no retracts going to the clearance plane or even retracts going five, 10 millimeters above. It just connects from one slice to the next slice, this slice to, the, to this slice. It's a 3D connection it creates between slice to slice, keeping the repositioning down to bare minimum. It doesn't go anything beyond that. iMachining 3D goes. Uh, iMachining 3D goes one step forward. You can apply a rest roughing, and it precisely knows where the material is remaining, and it will only generate the tool path. Okay, it will only generate the tool path where the material is remaining. For in this case, it will generate only into the corner. It will again go down to the deepest possible point. Do this first, then come up then do this then do this then do this up up till it doesn't find any more material to cut and this is how it finishes the machining okay uh right like i said when it does the scallop or step up it does automatic cutting conditions it adjusts the cutting conditions because it has got a completely uh different engagement happening now because when it was at this level okay when it was at this level the engagement of the tool was different when it goes a level up the engagement reduces once the engagement reduces it needs to readjust its cutting conditions for that particular engagement okay so you can see that in every slice it will keep changing and varying its engagement as well as the parameters I machining 3D can also be used for machining prismatic parts. If you don't want to select manually the pockets or curves, you can simply apply I machining. I machining will do exactly what 2D I machining will do, minus the scallops. It will not generate any scallops for uh, prismatic parts, and it will machine the entire part without any user's intervention. You don't need to specify where it has to do the machining. It will use the stock, the part find out the volumes to be scooped and it will do the machining for you automatically without uh, having to define any loops or whether you, uh, curves or faces tangential lead lead in and lead out now this is a feature of i machining user did not specify it this is calculated automatically based on the cutting tool and the geometry that is defined in the part so it's it's completely automated there is hardly anything that you can actually define inside i machining once you have defined those four items the wizard automatically again here determines the cutting conditions like it does with i machining 2d and i the cutting conditions are first generated for the deepest point and then the feed is increased up for the step up because the contact is reducing so the feed has to go up to maintain a constant chip thickness okay and by doing this it achieves the shortest possible cycle time okay so let's uh, go and check another part which is an i machining 3d part so let me open a part Let's open this. <clears throat> so I have a part here and my stock defined is uh, basically a block which is encompassing the entire part. So it knows, uh, it knows uh, how much stock has been defined. So it knows the volume that was defined here and what i will do here is uh, <clears throat> i'll go and set my things so again i'm going to use the same machine that uh, was defined here maybe this is a different uh, so let's 
okay, let's have a new database. Maybe the machine that I defined is not here, so I'll define a new machine. Uh, let's say an AMS MCV for 50 with a Siemens. This is with an 8,000 RPM. Feed rate is 10 meters. That's the cutting feed rate maximum. And the spindle power, because it's Siemens, it's 11 kilowatts. And I'll make six here, save and exit. So I'll pick that machine that I just generated. And the material, of course, uh, again, I will use 6061 just for the sake of demo. Say OK. <clears throat> right, so I'll add I machining 3D. Geometry, you can see no longer we are defining any uh, curves or faces or anything. We are just picking up the target as it is. So the entire 3D model is picked up as a target for machining. Let's go to the tool, let's define. Uh, in this case, I would like to add again another bullnose and it's going to be 16R3. Uh, okay, this is 35 and this is three flute. <clears throat> Okay, and the holder that I'm going to use is uh, at one. So that's my tool, my tool definition. I've not touched the eye machining parameters. If you want, we can check that. I'm using a 45 degree helix, the standard one. Okay, and it's a regular grade carbide. So my levels are automatically defined. If you don't want, I can just turn around. I can define that level here. So we can see that it's minus 37. That's the depth that it needs to go. And if I go into my technology wizard now, you can see it has already calculated everything for me. RPM, feed rate. On an EMS MCV 5450, it's going to take an RPM of 7,045. A feed rate, mean feed rate of 5.5 .5 meters. Step over maximum of five millimeters, that's radial. A minimum step over of 0 0.49, that translates to a VC of 354. And what about my uh, power? It's going to take 10.4 kilowatts. Now, this is a bit dicey. I do not want it to touch 10.4 kilowatts, probably because this may not be good for my spindle. So I can override sometimes, okay? I can simply go here and say, hey, just take seven kilowatts. Okay, so I'll say take seven kilowatt, everything else changes. Okay, everything else changes. I simply said just utilize seven kilowatt of my spindle, everything is changed. Okay, go to the technology. The scallop that has been calculated is 2.64. You can override the scallop and say, I would like to have two millimeter scallop in this case. Uh, Toolpath. Tolerance is 0.1. That's it. I'm going to save this and calculate. Okay, the calculation is done. I have selected, somebody asked me if I've selected a bull nose. Yes, I have selected a 16 corner radius three solid carbide bull nose. Okay, so if I run the simulation of this now on my solid verify, <clears throat> okay, that's my part with the uh, fixture and we'll run it you can see it took the full depth in one go and then once the full depth is over it has removed or scooped out maximum material in full depth it will then start making the scallops for me it will go up create the scallops yeah that's how it starts creating the scallops it's creating the scallop for me 
the two millimeter scallop that I asked it, it's going to maintain the scallop. Okay, you can see my parameters are completely changing. Keep an eye on the feed rate here. My feed rate is varying as the slice is increasing or the slice height is decreasing. The feed rates are varying. So it, it makes a completely different set of parameters for each slice that it cuts. Okay. Same thing as it goes below. So it will do one full depth, do the scallop, then it comes down, does the next depth, and does the next set of scallops to maintain that scallop that I've asked it to maintain, that two millimeter value that I've defined. It maintains that value. Right. So you can see this roughing is done on aluminum with a 16 bull nose corn radius three. The machining time is three minutes, 15 seconds. Now you know that if I change the material, it will <clears throat> immediately adopt to the new material and generate the parameters and the tool path automatically. Now there will be always a question. <clears throat> Sorry. There will be always a question whether uh, these parameters work or is it something you're throwing in or you're pulling from thin air and just throwing at the user and say, okay, this take these parameters and go to the machine. I can tell you from our experience from the last eight years or eight to nine years, there has never been an occasion where one of our users or customers has generated a program and gone to the machine and said, okay, let's run this at 25% of the feed rate. Never. It has never happened and it's never done also with eye machining. It's always cycle start with full 100% feed rate, feed override kept at 100%, okay? These parameters are not generated from thin air. They are scientifically calculated based on the inputs that you have given and these parameters work on the machine the very first time that you cut, okay? This is, this is not our statement. This is also a challenge from our side. Right, let's go. Uh, <clears throat> I, will, I will try and uh, take your questions as I go along. I know it's a bit lengthy presentation, but trust me, it's worth it's worthwhile uh, going till the end. Okay, uh, let's go back again to our presentation. <clears throat> there are several influences of peripherals that influence eye machining, okay? First of all, cooling influences eye machining. So what do we suggest here? If you are cutting steel, any grade of steel except stainless steel, okay? If you're cutting any grade of steel, you must use air, okay? Do not try to use coolant with steel on with eye machining. It's just not suggested, okay? Use air. If you're cutting stainless steel, aluminum, inconel, or titanium, which are basically sticky materials, you must use fluid coolant, okay? Some of my customers, which have got high-end machines, they also use mist. It works for sticky materials, but most of them use high-pressure fluid coolant for sticky materials. For steel, it must be high-pressure air. Cutting tools, recommended is tools with corner radius because they, uh, uh, they uh, prevent chipping. But in the event that you do not get tools with corner radius or chamfers, you can also go with plain flattened mills, they work very well. Tool holding, anything beyond eight diameter, we suggest you to go for hydro grips or power chuck. Anything below eight millimeters, it's your choice. Collets, really not suggested, but if you don't have any other way, you can use collets. Best below eight millimeters is to go for a shrink fit. Work holding, well, it will depend on the part. If it's a block, then suggested is to hold it in a hydraulic wise. But if it's uh, some kind of a part that needs set up, then you have a fixture, then you have to hold it in a fixture. There is no other way, but just ensure that whatever is a fixture, you make a judgment whether this fixture is rigid enough to go on a particular level of machining. So we have got level one to level eight. Like I said, you can move down to a, a lower level of aggression like level four and cut the part. <clears throat> Uh, 
I hope my audio is clear now. At least I am getting that feedback from my system that the audio is going through, right? I hope it's going through. Another things that uh, basically we need to talk about is if you're going to have a fluid coolant or air coolant, what should be your design of the ring, okay? Remember that if this is your part in the center of this is your tool, your fluid or air must hit the tool from four different directions at least, okay? The best is of course the ring that you're seeing here, but if you cannot achieve or you cannot make the ring, please ensure that you have got fluid or air hitting the tool at the cutting edges from four different directions. And angle, of course, it's difficult to measure, but try and maintain 90 degrees between them. Why? Because assume that you're machining on a wall here and you're trying to hit the air and only one nozzle is available. This particular portion, when it's going on the backside of cutting, it becomes a shadow region for that particular nozzle. So the tool will not get any kind of or the chips won't be evacuated. They will try to entangle within the tool and then you could have a lower tool life. In that case, we need another uh, nozzle to come from this side to hit the tool and remove the chips. But as it goes into a region like this and the tool is here, okay, then this and this will work very well. But if the tool goes on this side, okay, this won't work very well, this won't work very well, then you need to have another one coming from here and one coming from here. So it's always advisable to have uh, four nozzles hitting the tool when you're cutting this part. Uh, <clears throat> somebody is asking for actual cutting use hydro grip and radial using a shrink fit. In case of eye machining, assuming that you have a tool here, and this tool is, let's say, diameter 12, and it has got a 45 degree helix. Now, this 45 degree helix at a depth of cut of even 20 millimeters will behave like a screw, okay? So eye machining actually generates very high axial forces. And the whole mechanism of eye machining is like pulling the tool out from the holding device. So if you have a collet, it's a recipe for disaster because it will, the holding is hardly 1D in a collet. It will just pull the tool out of the collet, okay? Shrink fit for large diameters, really not suggested. The best is to go for hydro grip or power shock, which are really give you a very big clamping area and very rigid holding. It also, by the way, uh, gives a low run out on the tool. Uh, like I said, use hydro grip, shrink fit or power chuck. They give you the following benefits, minimized run out, which increases your tool life, cutting stability, you, when you go for higher depth of cut, it gives you stable cuts and high clamping forces, which prevent pulling out of the tool of high helix cutters. Uh, somebody is asking me if through coolant tools can be used. Yes, several of my customers use tools with, uh, with machines that I've got through, uh, through, coolant, uh, through coolant coming from the spindle and the tool is designed with the nozzles or the holes on the sides of the tool. They use it. It's very good for machining, uh, let's say, uh, sticky materials like aluminum, titanium, titanium, and inconel. They're damn good at that. So if you have a facility where you can use through coolant, please go for it. Uh, I will skip this machinability of the material, although I would like to explain to you why this is important, uh, because we are short of time, I guess. I will, I will take the liberty to go a little bit more into this. Uh, Machinability basically is a term that include that indicates uh, how the work material responds to the cutting process. Okay, uh, in in case of eye machining, you can see that the uh, material is only defined by UTS, and sometimes the UTS can be a misleading factor for materials. For example, if I take a steel, an EN grade steel, 30 HRC, it can have a a UTS anywhere between 680 to 750 Newton per mm square. Whereas the same material for, let's say for an SS304 could have similar UTS values. But the machinability of an EN grade material and machinability of an SS grade material are two different ball games. So it is very important to determine the machinability of a material and just not blindly go by the UTS, okay? So we have, Internally inside uh, solid cam, we have got 
let's go back to the software. If I go to the software and if I go to the material definition, which I skipped, but I think it's prudent to now tell you. <clears throat> if I go into the material, if I pick the material that I just defined, yeah, this one, you can see that we have a machinability factor here. Okay, this machinability factor uh, determines whether you're machining an EN grade material or a uh, SS grade material, although both of them have similar tensile strengths. Okay, now that machinability factor, let's go back to the presentation again. That machinability factor can be determined uh, by solid cam. We have a small test. I'll show you quickly what the test is. It's hardly four slides. So why that machinability is important? First of all, it allows your tool life to go dramatically higher because you are machining the exact material and not something close by. It allows eye machining to determine exact cutting conditions. You get a much better surface quality because you're cutting it properly. It reduces the chances of warpage, for example, in aluminum, okay? If, you're, if your uh, machinability is not right, you can sometimes get a much more aggressive cutting parameters based on the uh, UTS, okay? So it, machinability is very important and it improves the overall process if you get the machinability right, okay? There are several factors that affect the machinability. First of all, the physical properties of the material, the level of the process parameters, the cutting tool, material geometry, machining environment, a lot of things that effect but it's very difficult to determine or put these all factors into a cam system and ask it to generate so here we need to specifically tell i machining how it's going to or how we are going to determine the machinability of a material so it's very simple for example i take the sample material in this case let's say it's aisi 1045 steel i have a mazak uh, machine let's say with a 10 kilowatt spindle okay that's a continuous path size is 100 by 75 by 50. This has to be done by the customers for every batch of the material they receive because batch to batch, the machinability could vary. Cutting diam tool is a diameter 12 uh, uh, with four flute 45 degree helix. Cutting depth is approximately uh, uh, <clears throat> 24 millimeters. So what we do is we just go to the uh, mat web or let's say even with the uh, uh, material suppliers uh, test chart, we find out the uh, uh, ultimate tensile strength, put that, create a material. Then we go into eye machining 2D and we create a 2D eye machining pass for this, uh, sorry, for, for, sorry, for this step, okay? We create an eye machining 2D, very important, the eye machining it has to be performed at level eight. So it has to be on a, it need not be on a brand new machine. Relatively okay machine also can handle level eight, but the holding has to be very good, hydraulic wise and your tool in a power chuck, okay? So we uh, will open it or machine it at level eight. And very important, you need to adjust your depth. depth. It need not be 24 or it need not be 20, okay? What is important here is you need to uh, adjust your depth in such a way that you get a whole number as an ACP, okay? So if the depth is 24, you need not go 24. You can stop at 19 and say, 19 is giving me excellent result. I'm going to stop there, okay? That's my depth of cut. Why we are doing is, is we don't want the vibration and chatter to give us a completely different value of the machinability, right? So once that is done, we note down these parameters, we note down the minimum and maximum chip thickness that eye machining is, gen is generating, the maximum spin, the maximum cutting speed, the power requirement, the, these parameters here. And you can note that part for this particular cut on that machine, eye machining is giving 5.2 kilowatt as the power that the spindle will take when it's cutting this part. We take, generate the G code of this particular tool path. We take it to the machine. And after the machining starts, we ignore the first two passes because it could also be your material is having some kind of scaling and other things. So first two pass is ignored till it starts getting a uniform cut around the part. And once it starts getting uniform cut on the part, 
we start observing the spindle load on the controller and we note down the spindle load you need not machine the entire part you can but you need not machine the entire part even three or four passes is good enough for you to figure out the spindle load let's assume that the spindle load was showing 60 percent okay so 60 percent translates on a 10 kilowatt it translates to six kilowatts when i go back into my part you can see that it was actually showing that this cut would have taken 5.2 kilowatt but it's actually showing six kilowatt on the machine which means the material is much tougher than what the uts is showing okay so here the machinability is slightly poor than what the uts suggests it to be so what we do we get into the uh, mach uh, machinability factor okay here we had a slider before we don't have a slider but we put in a value minus means you're actually making it tougher plus means it is softer minus is harder plus is softer so we introduce a value let's we can simply calculate uh, 5.2 divided by 6 will give us 14 percent so approximately 14 to 16 percent we put that value go back here and the values that were captured in my earlier slide i had asked you to note down we just put those values here till we get six kilowatt okay so till we get six kilowatt we'll keep moving the slider up and down and the moment we get the spindle load as six kilowatt we know that this particular value is the machinability of that material so you will now know that machinability of the material was not exactly what uh, what the uh, uts suggested but it the material is much tougher than what the uts suggests so now you will be in a much better position to tell i machining that that's my uts and that's my machinability i machining will be in a much better position to determine the exact cutting conditions that will give you not only smooth cutting but amazingly improved tool life along with uh, the other host of uh, benefits that it offers okay so that was about uh, machinability just did that let's look at some of our success stories that uh, are running around today in india and across the world we have thousands of customers so i cannot put all those thousand uh, success stories here there are several of them in aerospace doing inconel and titanium machining and most of them come under some some or other sort of uh, non disclosure agreement so we cannot put all those figures here the uh, stories that have permission to be reproduced are only going to be shown here our first success came way back in 2006 when i machining was still in the development stage and the customer wanted to try this and this was a customer in the uk and this is titanium the same pocket was machined by Katia in 14 minutes, and I machining's first attempt was three and a half minutes. You can see the dramatic difference in cycle time. We are we are talking about 2000, uh, sorry, not 2006, 2011. Okay, it's not that much. 2011. Okay, that's when uh, we had I machining. It was still in development stage, and this was our first success story. We also have some customers in Israel who are making electronic products. For example, this was an aluminum 6061. The existing standard cutting time with a conventional cam system was 17 minutes. Uh, I machining cutting time, six minutes. So about 65% savings in cycle time. <clears throat> titanium, a customer called NIV Heritop in on titanium, they had to produce 75 parts. Their standard cutting time, 17 minutes. I machining 3D, the cutting time is three and a half minutes. So talking about total savings of 16 hours, 17 hours almost for 75 parts. Back to India from abroad, SIM tools our customer in Bangalore on an aluminium a BMS 7323 on a Makino F5 with 15,000 RPM, 11 kilowatt spindle power. Their overall cycle time earlier without I machining was 240 minutes. With I machining, it's down to 83 minutes. And most important here is a warpage. We brought down the warpage dramatically with I machining. <clears throat> Sri uh, Skanda Engineering in Bangalore on a steel E50, E250 on a BFW BMV 60 with 8,000 RPM, 
1.5 kilowatt uh, continuous power. Overall cycle time down from 360 minutes to 83 minutes. And this is like a savings of 80%. Tool life here was a critical, uh, was very critical here. We improved the tool life dramatically. Spurti machine tools, that's a turret part on an AMS MCV 650 with 11 kilowatt spindle, down from 42 minutes to 14 minutes, 16 seconds. And this part actually ran uh, quite a long batch to check also the tool life because they wanted to check if the tool life is what we are saying is true or false, but it came out pretty true. There was a dramatic increase also in the tool life of the part of, of the tool. Uh, stainless steel SS 17-4 uh, pH on a slim Makino. Their cycle time from 510 minutes down to 255 minutes. 51% savings in cycle time. Shakambri industry on a titanium on a Buckley Boy machine with 6,000 RPM and 5.5 kilowatt spindle. Cycle time down from 42 minutes to 14 minutes, 16 seconds. Grace Infrastructure Pondicherry on a BMV 35 on an H13 steel, down from 1200 minutes to 253 minutes. Again here, cycle time and tool life are very critical. Uh, uh, Roof polymers at Manesar on a EN31 40HRC BMV 60, roughing 360 minutes on our competing CAM solution, on eye machining 100 minutes, total cycle time down from 2000 minutes to 1380, that's like 32% on the overall cycle. Microtech Forgings, uh, a customer where we did a lot of trials with uh, Mitsubishi on an H13 55 HRC on a BMW 60 with a 7.5 kilowatt. Their existing cycle time with, with the same tools was 150 minutes and with same toolings with eye machining came down to 78 minutes, about 48% savings in cycle time. Indo-US on a A2 mold steel, Makino S33, 12,000 RPM, down from 180 minutes to 32 minutes. Same company on a copper electrode, roughing down from 23 minutes to three minutes, overall cycle time from 84 minutes to 57 minutes. Mini Aerospace on an aluminum 7075 on a Herco VMX24, down from 200 minutes to 84 minutes, 58% cycle saving, savings in cycle time. Ducom Bangalore on a magnesium H24. This material is very famous because a little bit of parameters here and there and the material catches fire. So their overall cycle time was 480 minutes before they introduced eye machining. Then it was down to 170 minutes on level four, okay? On a moderately aggressive level. Ravila Precision on a Ford Steel on a Tal BM500. 7.5 kilowatt and continuous 240 minutes down to 47 minutes. Pressy Hole Mumbai on a SSP uh, 660 Morisaki 20 year old machine. Overall cycle time down from 150 minutes to 22 minutes. Same tool, same machine, same setup, nothing changed. Only I machining was introduced. Maruti Suzuki uh, powertrain division on an H13 48 HRC Okuma 11 kilowatts. Overall cycle time from 260 minutes down to 108 minutes. Okay, the maximum machining here was done with a three flattened mill. So you can imagine the kind of cycle time reductions they would have got with the small tool. The last success story, very interesting. It was at Roku Roku in Japan on a tungsten carbide. They were using a competitive cam system and they were generating the machine carbide dyes and uh, their cycle time was 42 hours using nine tools. I machining's first attempt was 54 minutes on one tool. Okay, so you can imagine not just Inconel and titanium and CSS, we are I machining is also capable of doing excellent machining even on tungsten carbide. Okay, uh, similar success stories uh, are there. Like I said, I machining is available on four axis, it's also available on Milton and so on. I'll come towards the end of the uh, uh, towards the end of my presentation and also the show, but this is very important because a lot of uh, times when we start cutting the part on eye machining on a machine, the owner or the user or the operator immediately jumps and says, "Oh wow, you're taking such a high feed rate, so such a high RPM, such a depth 
big depth of cut, so much engagement into the material, what is going to be to happen to my machine? My machine will go for a toss if you cut like this. So a lot of uh, companies and universities worldwide uh, did experiments with eye machining to see how it either improves or does it destroy the machine over a period of time. Nine to 10 years is a pretty long, long time to determine the life of the machine using eye machining. So we had a very a unique uh, collaboration with the university in the Czech Republic, and they were more than glad to tell us why it happens and how it happens. First of all, eye machining toolpath combined with an optimum cutting conditions provided by the technology ensures constant load on the tool. That's very important. You have already seen that. Eye machining will also ensure that the spindle load will vary anywhere between 4% to 17%, sometimes to 25%, nothing beyond it. Hermle company concluded that with eye machining, the forces acting on the spindle are the smallest of all the CAM systems using similar technology. Very important. Makino also tested eye machining on its A55 and A61 machines and reached similar conclusions. Now, these are just statements. I can put the statements, okay? There is no hard evidence. The hard evidence comes with a cooperation, a research that we did with the University of Bohemia and the Czech Republic. And the whole idea was measuring the forces acting on the spindle, acting on the workpiece, okay? And on the axis. So what this uh, university had, they had dynamometers, and these dynamometers were connected to the spindle to measure the force on the spindle. They had actual dynamometer, and these are, were used to machine possible uh, forces on the machine table. They also have workpiece dynamometers, and these dynamometers are designed for cutting force measurement on the workpiece itself, as well as the machine table. So what we did here, we connected the machine through dynamometers, through cables, to a computer, and the computer was one and running a LabVIEW software to measure the forces. And we had the sample part on aluminum, 100 BHN, and a tool of diameter eight with three floats, cutting length of 30 millimeters, and a helix angle of 38. And we used eye machining level five, which is basically a moderate level of cutting. Then we compared the forces with the same tool on the same material using a conventional cam technique, which is a pocketing technique, where we took four millimeter depth of cut, a seven millimeter side step, and we measured the force acting on the spindle and the workpiece. And this is how the force was measured, where you have uh, green, which is basically the cutting force. On the x-axis is basically the time of machining, and on the y-axis is force measured. So at four millimeter depth of cut, seven millimeter sidestep and an FZ value of 0 0.09, an average of 350 newtons was observed on the machine spindle, okay? Now we move the same cutting with eye machining. And with eye machining, with a, with a VC of 283, feed rate of 4.5 meters and a depth of cut of 24 millimeters. That is six times the depth of cut used in conventional. The force was measured and the force that came up on the computer was approximately on an average 220 newtons. Okay, this was the force measured. So you have got 350 here, 220 here. Now, if you are using even simple mathematics and predicting the life of the machine using the force acting on it, common sense would tell us that the strategy that uses the least amount of force or exerts the least amount of force on the machine and on the spindle is the one that is going to give us the maximum life on the machine. So eye machining not reduces the life of a machine, but it actually increases the life of a machine. This is a hard evidence coming from a lab where this test was done. The other hard evidence that I will present now, which I'll come to the end of the presentation, is the improvement in tool life when machining extremely tough to cut materials. 
for example this this uh, uh, research was done with Kenna metal and uh, it was done using one of their tools on a stainless steel and titanium blocks which were supplied either by a major aerospace company but the titanium block was brought by the company that was making this test cuts that is uh, Kenna metal and we checked the periphery and pocket machining principles of eye machining on a Mazak FJV 200 with 12,000 RPM and 15 kilowatt continuous feed rate. This was the stainless steel P660 trials on a stock size of 250, 200 by 60. The outside and inside cut, this entire part was done rough and finished in three minutes, 36 seconds on a P660 on a Mazak FJV uh, 660, uh, 12, sorry, 1250. Okay, and then we moved to titanium, where we took a stock size of 200 by 175 by 50 and machined this whole thing using the tools. Uh, the roughing was approximately three minutes, 18 seconds. Uh, finishing was four minutes, uh, internal roughing was four minutes, 42 seconds. And we made another pocket into that with three minutes, 58 seconds. And after this was done, the tool was put on a 20x magnification to check the wear of the tool, okay? And what we observed, what was observed was a 0.1 millimeter wear was observed uniformly on all the edges of the tool, okay? Now this is at 20 times the magnification. So if you put it at naked eye, or even if you have a feel of the edge, you will see that actually, nothing was well, had happened in spite of going so much aggressive into the material on that particular machine for these tools so there is a hard evidence now that the tool life also goes up dramatically up with eye machining one because we use exact cutting conditions specifically for that machine material geometry and the tool second we use the full flute length so even if there's a wear the wear is completely uniform on the tool it's not on the first then five millimeters or two millimeters of the tool, it's completely uniform. So even the regrinding becomes much more easier. If that tool has a land, then the tool can be reground several times without any compromise on the dimensions of the tool itself. So this is a hard evidence, even for the tool life with eye machining. We have got tons of such examples where, uh, of course, not documented, coming from customers where they have found dramatic improvements, in, not only in cycle times, but even on two lives, okay? So um, if I have to make a concluding statement at the end, it is basically that solid cam and eye machining, they're both a unique, unbeatable cam solution that provides you the best value. And anybody who is not using eye machining, I'm sorry, you're losing money by not using eye machining because it's dramatically going to alter your machining time. And if I cut down your machining time, it's direct money for you. It's direct cash for the company. Right, thank you very much. What I will do now is I will try and take as many questions as possible. Uh, sorry, let's go up because there were many uh, questions saying the audio is not working, but let me take a few questions here. Uh, Okay. Somebody asked me which end mill is better uh, for eye machining, three flute, four flute, five flute, or six flute. Mm. Aluminium, you cannot go beyond three flute. Probably the cutting tool people will be able to tell you why they cannot go beyond three flute. I think it's more to do with the uh, relief where they take really heavy depth of cuts and soft material and the chip has to flow. So there they cannot give you a very, uh, they cannot go beyond three flutes for aluminium. But for steel, and inconel and titanium, yes, the higher the amount of flutes, better and faster is the machining. I can give you an example with a cutting tool company that we did a trials with on inconel, six diameter with eight flutes. And we did the machining in approximately one fifth the time of what the company was expected to cut that part in on inconel. So six diameter with eight flutes. You can imagine the kind of tool that was, and that tool was developed specifically for eye machining. Okay, it's special tool to figure out that whether the number of flutes have any influence with eye machining, and it was found that greatly influences the uh, the uh, 
machining time. Uh, Somebody is uh, saying that they used Mastercam, uh, Dellcam is spirit. I'm, I don't know on what materials you've used it and what is your cutting time for those materials. But I can tell you today with our 11 years of experience working with eye machining, today if I, I can give you an example of Bangalore because that's where I have maximum number of people using eye machining. If you stand in Pena and let's say I draw a circle of five kilometer radius, I could easily have about 5,000 machines running eye machining on different materials. And each of them would have at least evaluated uh, every other software, given them the parts. And that's that's another very unique thing that when you compare eye machining, you have to compare it in, in totality, okay? What eye machining is capable of doing. And the best part with us is that if you give us a part to machine, we would probably end up doing the programming right in front of you because it doesn't take much, much, much time to work with eye machining, even on real life examples. So a lot of times our, uh, our sale to a customer becomes much more easier because we are able to do the cutting right in front of the customer. We generally don't take a data, go back home, work on it for a few weeks and then come back to do the trials. No, we don't do that. We do it right in front of the customer. And that's probably our strength. Uh, what is the cons of eye machining? Well, the cons of eye machining, I don't see anything apart from the fact that Currently, eye machining is only suitable to work with solid carbide end mills. Somebody also asked this question if we can work with inserted end mills. I would not say no, because there are several of my customers who have found a way in eye machining to work with inserted cutters like porcupine cutters. But officially, if you ask me, we do not support inserted cutters at the moment. <clears throat> uh, Would eye machining suppress the need for other solid cam modules? No, eye machining works as a complement to HSM basically, because eye machining is capable of only doing roughing and rest roughing. Beyond that, if you want to move the process, you will still need HSM, HSS, and so on to finish the part. Eye machining can go, if it's a prismatic part, then it will not need anything. It can, it can rough and finish the part on its own, but if it's a 3D part, it will need the support of HSM, HSS, and other things to finish the part. Uh, how the HSM offered by other software is different from my machining? Ah, uh, that's a good question. For that, I'd love to go back to my very first slide where I explained to you certain things. Do you remember this slide? I explained to you that there are two, two things in it. One is the variable cutting angle. Nobody is offering this. And the other one is the variable feed rate based on the cutting angle that is uh, in contact, okay? Now, both of these together generate constant cutting force. Go to any of the HSM competitors that you have today. Nobody talks about constant cutting force. They either will talk about constant cutting angle or constant step over. Other than these two principles, they do not talk about constant cutting force and they will not talk about constant cutting force because constant cutting force principle is patented inside eye machining nobody can nobody can copy this principle and that's the major differentiator between eye machining and our other hsm competitors that are there in the market uh can we use deep shoulder milling cutter no sir a deep shoulder milling cutter, I believe, is an inserted cutter. You cannot use it because eye machining officially at the moment doesn't support inserted cutters. But like I said, my customers are using the uh, porcupine end mills, inserted cutters up to diameter 40, and they are cutting parts in stainless steel and steel. Uh, do you have training center in Pune? Yes, we have in Barnair. You can get in touch. I will uh, put my uh, email address at the end. Uh, that should be my slide. Just type in, I forgot to give, put that uh, uh, slide here. So I will make a new thing here. Just put this in for India at solidcam.com. Okay, let's increase the 
this one, 30. So that's the uh, email address, uh, please note down. You can get in touch with uh, us on this email address and uh, get us a part, give us a part. Don't believe I'm machining blindly, okay? And if you have already seen other HSM solutions, give us a part and give the other HSM solutions also the same part, give the same conditions, and you will see at least a two to three times difference in cycle time by iMachining with everybody else. And this is our challenge, okay? And this challenge is not coming because just I want to throw a challenge. This is coming based on our experience by, of working with iMachining for the last 11 years, cutting different materials, different machines. We, in fact, in one of the exhibitions, we were given an engraving machine with I think it was one kilowatt spindle power and we cut steel on it with one kilowatt spindle power with a depth of cut of 20 millimeters with a 10 millimeter rain mill. That was a maximum diameter that machine could take. We did even that. So eye machining is not limited by material and machine. Eye machining is it's limitless. As long as you can define things correctly inside eye machining, if the inputs are defined correctly, you don't have to worry about the output. The output will always be perfect. Uh, somebody is asking, uh, are you saying that it's not possible to use HSS end mills to make? No, you can use I machining. I, I told you that when you uh, when we go into uh, the tool definition here, let me go into the tool definition. <clears throat> if I go into the tool definition, and if I go into the uh, I data, you can see that I have got HSS here, I can define HSS. So the moment I say this is HSS, and I say, okay, come back to the technology wizard, you can see everything has dropped, changed completely. Okay, so it can also take into account the tool that you're giving, the tool material is also taken into account. It's not just the uh, carbide, but we can also go with a cobalt coated cutter or plain HSS, or a premium fine grade carbide, ultra fine they call it, which can have much higher parameters. So we can, we need to specify what is the grade of the cutting tool material that we are using. Based on that, I machining will calculate the parameters. Uh, should we use it? I think I just don't want to. Ah, somebody asked me a question. Also very interesting is, can we use? air turbine tools offering up to 50k rpm uh, for people who want to have further information on this they can go to youtube and type in colibri spindles c-o-l-i i'll just open it for you let's go to youtube and let's go to i think it's colibri spindles yeah Right, you can go to these spindles. These are actually uh, driven not by air, but these are driven by coolant pressure. And the RPM here, it's capable of, because there are several models available, and it also depends on the pressure, coolant pressure. They can go from 20,000 and in the steps of 20,000, 40,000, 60,000, 80,000, okay? You can go that. And these spindles also use I machining. There are several videos where they show you that eye machining is being used with this particular spindle, okay? So several of my customers do that because uh, they don't want to change the spindle of the machine. So they get this, uh, these spindles, these jet spindles. For example, this one is with, uh, it runs on the coolant pressure, just attach the pipes of the coolant and it generates an RPM of minimum of 20,000 and then the steps based on the model on the, and the coolant pressure. Okay, so uh, I will just type uh, in the chat area, the spindles, it's Colibri spindles. And you can actually uh, uh, go to YouTube and uh, see the uh, cutting happening even with the smallest possible tool on these spindles. Uh, for people who are more interested in using this product, more than welcome. Please uh, go to uh, solidcam.com. Once the uh, side, site loads up, click on this green icon here called uh, Get Trial. 
here. Click on the get trial uh, uh, button. It will take you to a page and you need to specify whether you have SOLIDWORKS or Inventor. But if you don't have either of them, you can say, I don't have SOLIDWORKS or Autodesk Inventor. You click on that. It will take you to a registration page. page. Please enter your true credentials. I have seen people entering A, A, B, D, C, C, E, D, D. Just enter your two credentials. Also your email address because the link will go there. And once your registration is done, you'll get the link to download the product. And you can use the product for 60 days without the need for any license. The product is completely opened. There is nothing that is going to be hidden from the user. All the modules are opened, including eye machining, three axis, two and a half axis, uh, five axis, Milton, turn mill, everything is open to the user. They can use it. Also, we have, during this lockdown, we have utilized a web-based training completely. We run six to eight sessions every day. So you can join those sessions and you can get trained on the product. Somebody asked, does it include SOLIDWORKS? Yes, when you say that, when you click this, I don't have SOLIDWORKS or Autodesk in, in installed, it will give you a version of SOLIDCAM which comes bundled with SOLIDWORKS. So you can use Solid, the product, we call it embedded system. You can use it for 60 days without the need for any license, but just ensure you get in touch with us at the email address that I provided and uh, use that uh, email address to contact us. We will tell you which slots are available for training and we can start training you completely on the product. The training can go on for a week and then you can start using the product on your own. Uh, somebody is asking in case of heavy depth of cut, how eye machining tackles wear out and does it give an alarm? Mm, not really. This Now this becomes an artificial intelligence. The machine will have to, but the only thing uh, we generally tell the operator is to keep an eye on the cutting load. If the variance in the spindle load goes beyond five to seven percent, we will safely assume that the tool has started to wear out and it's time to check the tool. So the operator can check the tool and if it's if he feels the judgment, if he feels that it's still good enough to continue, we can continue. But beyond 10 to 12 percent increase in the spindle load, it means that the tool has really gone bad and it needs to go to regrinding as soon as possible. So that's the only uh, area that we ask people to look out for, especially the operators, once the machining starts. Do we provide SOLIDWORKS training? Uh, as a part of SOLIDCAM training, we do provide basic SOLIDWORKS training, and uh, that's, that, that is something you can take advantage of. How to join daily trainings? Like I, I'm just going to put the email address here. Uh, I'm putting the email address so everybody gets the email address uh sending to everybody please get in touch with us on this email address and you can uh, we will tell you which slot is available you can choose a slot that is comfortable to you and join the training now these trainings are conducted online but they are conducted by offices in delhi pune and bangalore so depending on your availability you could join at any one place since they are online the location is immaterial you can join at any place the only thing just make sure that the timings are convenient to you can we use a T slot with eye machining? Uh, some of my customers, by the way, are uh, doing a T slot with eye machining. They do very interesting cutting. But if you ask me whether I have done it personally, no, I have not done it. But uh, several of my customers have done. They do the slot, the ring slot that is there on the component. They use a T slot with eye machining on that. Uh, you got only 30 days of trial. I think you have not downloaded the latest one. The, the latest one is 2020 SP1. Please download 2020 SP1 that I'll also put here. Uh, Solid Camp 2020 SP1. Uh, please download that. In event that uh, you still don't, uh, uh, you still don't get uh, the uh, license. You feel that it's expiring in 30 days. Please get in touch with you with us we will extend that license for another 30 days. Okay, so uh, don't worry about the trial. Start using it. If you feel you like the product and you say, I would like to evaluate it further for another 30 days, please get in touch with us. We will give you a license for that. Uh, do I have training centers in Hyderabad? No, sir, not an, yes, we do, sorry. 
my mistake. We do have, we have a very powerful reseller in Hyderabad called as Bliss Business Solutions, and they do conduct training on Solid Chem. So you can either get in touch with them or best is to get in touch with the email address that I just passed on to everybody in the chat area and uh, uh, just uh, get in touch with us. We can help you train this because I think we still have a few days of the lockdown. And uh, even if it open, uh, opens up, it's going to be kind of a graded lockdown. So you can still use our the benefit of on uh, online trainings the other way is also to go to solid cam um, website and go to solid cam professor once you have the registration the professor videos will open up you can go to solid cam university you can learn the software also from solid cam university solid cam university is a free resource you can actually access solid cam university from uh, youtube here I'm sorry, University. Yes, that's it. So you go to Solid Chem University and you can see all the training videos are put on Solid Chem University. So you can even look at Solid Chem University and uh, le learn the product. Well, yes, the training has started uh, long back, but don't worry. You can still get in touch with us and there will be some or other batch which will be starting from beginning, you can join them. The only thing will be the timing so that you will have to manage. Uh, where to register for the online training? Uh, it's info.india. Info.india at solidcam.com. I've just uh, sent it to everybody. You can see it in your chat window. You should see the, uh, uh, you should see the, email address in your chat window. Uh, can we use a trial to conduct some machining on our BFW VMC? Yes, you can, provided you first learn the product. And uh, for at least for the first trial of IM machining, one of our personnel has to be there because he needs to check a few things. Somebody is asking, do you have a post processor for Sugami? I'm sorry, this is not my area. Sugami is not my area. Sugami will be conducted on Thursday evening. Please join that webinar on Thursday evening where we have a webinar, a very interesting webinar conducted by Marina on uh, Milton, complex Miltons with multi-channels as well as Swiss types. So that question needs to be posed there. Do we have integration with uh, uh, PTC Creo? No, we don't have integration with PTC Creo. We basically uh, go to PTC Creo again through SolidWorks where we can import uh, directly PTC files. So you can import the Creo files here. You can directly import the Creo files and uh, you can work with the Creo files with, with SolidWorks. Right, I think it was a pretty interesting session, almost two and a half hours. And I think majority of our uh, attendees uh, stayed till the uh, end. Please also note that this entire session is recorded and uh, everybody who has attended this session will also get a link to this recording on their email address. They can, it will be basically be on YouTube. You can access the recording. And if there are questions, you again, you always have the email address. Please get in touch with us. And please also register for our, another interesting webinar happening on Thursday, which is on uh, Milton and switch type programming, which will show you the power of solid cam on to handle these machines, right? Uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar. I hope I have imparted some knowledge to you, some information. We always keep learning. So this was a part of our learning also. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, keep safe, take care and bye-bye. Uh,